first speaker of the last day of the program. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Thank Thank you. Also, well. Thank you. 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 Uh, any 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 computer works, right? This is what you're saying. Because um, I see also this computer oh, no, connected. This one is just streaming the video. Okay. Video. Okay. 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 So um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much for this very nice, uh, you know, uh, program. And. Uh, So uh, thank you the organizer for the nice invitation. And uh, I planned for probably 45 minutes, but I can't speak for 30 minutes because of the program, but I will speak for 45 minutes if possible. So, so uh, my talk, uh, the title of the talk and the topic of the talk is about numerical schemes for stochastic sum models in hydrodynamics. And I will start with Navistocks 2D, but I will show you some uh, results that we have and work in progress for other models like Businesk or some porous media equation. This work is with uh, jointly, this is like a collection of actually uh, three, uh, three papers. And this is uh, a joint work with uh, Anunie. And uh, this work is partially supported by the National Science Foundation that I thank for their support. Okay. So the outline of my talk is uh, probably everybody knows uh, the, the Navier-Stokes equation, but I will just you know, re re remind you about the equation, the stochastic case. I will give you some well posed uh, results. They are known, but I will just remind you about them. I put it in you know, the setting. I will show you the setting where we are working. And then I will, um, I will focus specifically about uh, discretization mm -hmm. in time, because we already have actually the discretization in time and space, but because of the lack of uh, time, I will focus only on the time discretization, specifically about the fully implicit Euler method in time. And I will show you some speed of convergences, some results. And then I will show you the application for other models in fluid, fluid dynamics, and then some more open questions and working problems. Okay, so to the Navier-Stokes equation, um, let me just say that uh, the restriction in our case is that we have to work on a periodic uh, periodic domain, the two-dimensional torus. So we are working, we are taking domain uh, uh, D zero L square with periodic boundary conditions with the period to be L, for example. Uh, U here is the velocity field, P is the pressure, and G is an operator acting on the solution, and W is a, uh, is a white noise. White noise in time, but colored in space. So very nice in space, especially very nice. So this the equation one is the conservation of momentum. Uh, equation two is the incompressibility uh, equation. And then you will have the boundary condition um, and the initial condition. So this is very general. For Navier-Stokes, the functional setting very quickly is that uh, we have the domain H, which is, which is endowed with the L2 norm, and the V space, which is endowed with the H1 norm. These are the typical uh, uh, spaces for incompressible Navier-Stokes. Okay, so inside you have the divergence equal to zero plus the periodic boundary. So I will rewrite everything in a very uh, abstract form, like uh, the Navier-Stokes abstract form, where the operator A is just the Stokes operator, and B is the nonlinear operator. Okay, the nonlinear. So uh, a Navier-Stokes written in the abstract form will be written as du plus nu. The viscosity nu is a, co a constant coefficient, 
strictly positive, by the way. So mu a u plus b of u u d t equal to g of u dw. So this is really in an, an abstract uh, form. And uh, the new, the viscosity new, when u is equal to zero, this becomes the Euler equation and the results are completely different from the Euler equation. So very nice properties of the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, people that are working with uh, Navier-Stokes, uh, it is well known that you have, because of divergence equal to zero, uh, then B of U, V, V, the inner product in L2 is zero. And you have very nice properties in the sense that if X is an interpolation space between the V and the H, so H1 and L2, then you have this nice uh, properties, uh, property number two, which is an inequality that is nice. And um, property three shows you just the difficulty of the Navier Stokes, which is the fact that it is not globally Lipschitz. It is, um, so the operator B is locally Lipschitz because of the second, uh, quantity here, uh, as you see here. So for in, in a bounded ball, this is, you know, you can consider it to be, you know, like a Lipschitz condition. So um, these are the properties. The other property, as I said, about the Lipschitz condition is this property one in this lemma. Again, so it's really locally, really locally Lipschitz. And the last property, the number two, this is what is crucial and uh, we cannot do without, at least in this particular case, because we are working with um, uh, strong uh, solutions in the PDE sense. And this property is true only for periodic boundary conditions. In 2D, periodic boundary conditions. In 3D, is complicated, okay? And it can be true for certain periodic, uh, for certain uh, boundary conditions that are called the, the uh, friction boundary condition, if you wish, you know. But this condition, which is absolutely crucial, this is why we are working in the periodic boundary, uh, boundary condition setting, okay? And it, it's necessary for our calculation. And by the way, there are no results in the non-boundary, in the non-periodic uh, setting, you know. Many people are working on the numerical schemes and uh, it's all, in fact, some references. I'm going to give you some references about the people that are working um, on the numerical schemes. And I have to apologize that uh, my list is not exhaustive because I am focusing specifically on uh, people that are working with, these are all people that are working for implicit Euler scheme, for Navier Stokes incompressible, and uh, they get rate of convergence. There are other, you know, uh, resorts where you have um, numerical schemes, but without rate of convergence, and I didn't, you know, I didn't put them here because I am specifically looking for, you know, rate of convergence. And uh, these are for the moment the ones that, that we have. So um, the paper of Jezhnev Karelli Hall, they use time and space, by the way, with finite elements and Euler scheme in time. And uh, this is, uh, by the way, the first one is, uh, is in 3D. And they, they don't have a rate of convergence, but it's 3D. So, I mean, what can you get for 3D? The second one, Carly Hall, rate of convergence for the discretization of the stochastic Navier Stokes uh, in 2012, they have um, time, so implicit, fully implicit order in time, finite elements in space. It's 2D Navier Stokes with periodic boundary conditions, for sure. And they have rate of convergences, and the convergence is in probability, localized. And I will explain exactly this, you know, convergence. Uh, myself and uh, Brezhnev and uh, Nye, our first paper was uh, using the splitting method for the Navier Stokes with some rate of convergence in probability also. Uh, Brett, Brett and Dobson, they improved the result of Carly Paul, the second, 
the second paper here, they improved it because the rate of convergence in probability was of order one fourth in time. They tried to improve this rate of convergence uh, by one half. Like this, with the same conditions, it's a little bit better rate. But the convergence is in probability. Okay. Then uh, with Ami, in this in 2019, uh, what we did is that we uh, we uh, were able we did the time for this paper. We did only the time. We did implicit, fully implicit. We got convergence, strong convergence, and with very good rates of order one half minus. Okay, this uh, by the way with the multiplicative norms. All the results of before. Uh, sorry about that. Um, all these are with a multiplicative noise. Multiplicative noise, linear, of course. And um, uh, this paper here, it's also with a multiplicative noise, and we get rate of convergence. I will show you, by the way. And they are really strong. So it's, they are in mean square. And uh, it's, uh, I will show you that, okay, in the multiplicative noise, it's logarithmic. It's not that good. But in the particular case where it's additive, it's one half minus. It's the best. Okay. Uh, for, so we improved, you know, we, we tried to implement this for the time and space here. Or this was only time. Here, time and space using finite elements. And um, the third one, which uh, we try to work only with additive noise, and this is pretty sharp. Uh, here we did time and space, but I will show you only the time today. In this particular case, working just with additive noise, we can do a lot of calculations. The rate of convergence is one half minus, and for now, and it's strong convergence, so we mean square. And so far, it's, uh, it's pretty sharp. And uh, we try to, to, to implement it for other models here. For example, this porous media model, which is 3D equation. Okay, so uh, assumptions. Let me just show you the assumptions for the noise. Uh, w here is a, a K valued Brownian motion. So, and K here is um, another Hilbert space. It's a nice one, can be H1, for example. Uh, U0, we take it to be in V, so it's an H1 uh, element. You can take it to be deterministic or to be random, like uh, LP in omega, but with values in H1. This is uh, the fact that we make it to be a strong solution in the PD sense. It's not only a weak solution, but it's strong solution. The assumption on the operator G, we, we take it to be Hilbert Schmidt, so very nice. Hilbert Schmidt. And um, Hilbert Schmidt from K to H with linear growth and Lipschitz. I mean, the typical. And uh, we take a little bit stronger conditions. So uh, if you apply the operator A1 half for, uh, for the operator G, we have Hilbert Schmidt in L2, you know, so Hilbert Schmidt from K into H1. Thank you. So these are also very classical, somehow. Um, conditions to have existence and uniqueness of solutions with my estimates. Uh, of course, you can ask me what happens, uh, you know, if the noise is uh, white in space, white space time, white noise. These are, it's another story. I mean, this is, uh, you can, you know, there are some results there, but you have to be really careful about how regular you have to take the space. So I am not discussing that. I'm taking the noise to be colored in space and very, very nice. It's pretty, uh, how do you say, classical theory that under assumption G, uh, and if the initial condition is just L2, then you can, there exists uh, a unique uh, adapted process uh, U, such that P almost surely, it is continuously rising H, intersection L4 or LP with values in uh, B. And, you know, against the test function, you have uh, the solution, you know, you can write it uh, against the test function P, which is in the domain of A, and you have very nice estimates, unexpected ones, and everything works. 
Uh, if you take the assumption G prime, you have uh, better and the initial condition to have this uh, moments, so to be in Z instead of uh, H in L2, then you can find the solution, as I said, in the PD sense, it's strong, meaning that P almost surely it's continuous with values in V, which is H1. And L2, zero T with values in the domain of H of A, which is enjoyed with the non H2. Okay, and you have better estimate or classical. So, you know, this is, you know, again, you can get them, no, no problem. Uh, there is, um, if the noise is bounded, not only additive, but bounded, you can have, and you have uh, the coefficient alpha to be small enough of the order of viscosity divided by K0, which is the coefficient in front of, uh, let's say the noise, if you want, the intensity of the noise. So do you have exponential moment uh, of the norm of the H1 norm, gradient of green L2, okay? And this is also, um, let me say, uh, typical, I mean, uh, it has been proven by other people, by um, Martin Lehirer in one of the their papers, and uh, it's not difficult, so we proved it also in our paper, with better, better estimate. Uh, hold the regularity of the solution also, uh, it has been proven, at least in, uh, in Karabi Hall, that the L2 norm, so if you take the, you know, the two points P and S, in uh, capital zero, uh, in zero T, then the expected value of U of T minus U of S in the L2 norm to the power P is less or equal than a constant T minus S to the power eta P. This eta is between zero and one. So regularity in time with any, we are, we need a better, so we need the regularity, hold the regularity in the uh, H1 norm, and uh, this is, you have to be careful about it, you know. So what we were able to prove, and this is all we need for the moment. So if you take a discretization of the interval zero capital T, Tj and T, uh, Tj being um, a partition on the interval zero capital T, what we were able to prove is that the expected value of the sum of the interval of Tj minus one Tj of the norm the norm, the U, US minus UTJ minus one, and also the one minus UTJ, but in the H1 norm, harder, and then you take it to the power Q, this is less or equal than T to the capital T over capital N uh, to the power eta Q. This gives you a regularity, a time regularity for the solution, okay? And we have it also in the L4 norm, and I will show you what we need. So this is very nice theorem that we were able to, to prove in our last report in 2021. Now, let me show you the discretization uh, scheme here. As I said, you know, the discretization, you just take a partition TK of the interval zero capital T. You take a mesh size H to be TK plus one minus TK. And uh, you choose the initial uh, sequence uh, in at the point T0 to be the initial condition, okay? And um, then you define a sequence UK to be, uh, so you, uh, UK, which is, I, I write it to be uh, UK, which is U end of UK, to be um, the following solution of the following uh, algorithm, UK minus UK minus one against the text function P pi plus H, Mu gradient UK gradient phi plus B of UK UK phi equal to G of UK minus one delta W phi. This phi is in, in H1. Okay, this is our fully implicit algorithm, and you see that it's really implicit in both the, the nonlinear term and in the for the Laplace. In the for the stochastic uh, Portion we make it to be explicit because uh, because of the um, measurability it has to be adapted so you have to take UK minus okay okay so this is and delta k is just the you know the, the difference W T K minus W T K minus 
Okay, so uh, this this is actually it's a discrete it's a discrete uh, equation. Okay, and uh, you have to prove that this um, this equation has a solution, and uh, the solution has nice estimates. Uh, by the way, jump in, ask questions anytime. You can stop me. It's better. Yeah. Don't let the question uh, linger until uh, the end. So, Cavalli-Paul, uh, in fact, they used also the same algorithm for the, the equation for the Nagel Stokes, and they proved that this algorithm has a solution, a unique solution, uh, adapted, etc. And um, so it's UK is FTK measurable and satisfies these nice estimates that we use. It has other estimates, very nice ones, but in particular, this nice estimate. So for example, the H1 norm, and you have all moments of the H1 norm, and the little bit more. Okay. Now the error. Let's define EK to be UTK, so the solution at the grid point TK minus the algorithmic, the, in, the algorithmic implicit solution UK. And we, uh, as a consequence, uh, use uh, E0, the first uh, sequence E0, the first element of the sequence is 0. Then for any phi in V, EJ is going to be solution of the following equation as you see here, okay? Um, our goal is to prove that the error EJ converges to zero when n goes to infinity in some functional space and find some rate of convergence. So, I mean, now we have to do some estimates, right? And uh, the idea is that we have to estimate each term of the, um, each term in the equation that I showed you before. And the difficulty, let me just focus on the difficulty. The difficulty here is in the nonlinear term, which is non -lipsious. Okay, so the nonlinear term is, you can split it in three pieces, mainly. When you take the nonlinear term here, it's T1, T2, T3. And uh, each term, you have to then estimate one by one. I will just show you, you know, the, I will just show you the difficulties of T1, T2, T3. This is the nonlinear term in three pieces. T2 and T3 are somehow we can manage. The difficulty is mainly in T1. And there is no way you cannot, you know. I mean, you split it the way you want, you will end up with the same difficulty. Okay? So, for example, uh, Cavalry Paul, instead of uh, having this. Uh, uh, instead, so this nonlinear term, the same difficulty, we preferred to uh, write it in terms of the solution, the, ex the exact solution. They write it in terms of the um, algorithmic solution, the UK, instead of UTJ. We have better estimates, in our case, we have better estimates for UTJ instead of the UK. Okay, so this is like uh, one main difference between the two. Okay, so um, so as I said, uh, let me start with the main difficulty. T1, so you know, yes? The EJ is the the, the, the the EJ is the... The error. Ah, it's the error. Okay, sorry, yeah, okay, okay. Was it clear for everybody that EJ yeah, well, is the error? Well, I, it was on the last slide, but I already have forgotten. It's probably clear. Ah, you already forgot. It is clear. It is clear. It's, it's always uh, error, error. It's like, it's, it's error, right? Yeah, yeah. No, ah, okay, I mean, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> up to you. I mean, so I called it EJ, but, it's but yeah, it's EJ. EJ is the error. Yes. Sure. For everybody, EJ, and I'm focusing just, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not uh, saying anything about the details, but ask me, jump in anytime. Uh, EJ is the error, and in particular, let me show you again, let me come back, the error, I write the error, this is the error, you see the error, U at the grid point TK, uh, EK is UTK minus UK, which is the, uh, the implicit, uh, the sequence for the implicit scheme, okay? 
Good. So and and we write now EJ. We write the equation for EJ. Oh. <laughs> what is it here? So this equation seven is the equation for the air. So EJ minus EJ minus one. This one is the gradient EJ. In fact, the yeah, gradient US minus gradient of UJ. So uh, I mean, if you wish, I mean, but it's more complicated than that. You have to rewrite it a little bit because e, EJ, EK is U in TK. So here I have to split it uh, in two pieces to make sure that you have the US minus U TK and then plus UTK minus gradient of UTJ, uh, UJ. And then, I mean, you have more, another, another term. And then the, this is where you are using the regularity, you know, in the H1 norm, for example, you see? Uh, and, and the nonlinear term, B of US minus B of UJ, phi, this is the nonlinear term that gives rise to these three terms that I showed you. Okay, so the first term is the challenging one because it's nonlinear. You have EJ, EJ, and this is UTJ. Remember that this nonlinear term is EJ gradient UTJ in a product with EJ. So, when you go back to that one, you took UTJ and you took no formula. You took G, G, capital G, and uh, W is fully explicit, right? Uh, is it that going to cause problem? Because you say G, it again, which G, one? G7, G, J minus one. Uh, is it that G I, uh, this one is just to make this integral to be a stochastic integral. I need it to be adapted. So you have to take U, J minus one. But that means that in the generalization, the term capital G in W, you take it, you don't take any implicitness. No, uh, the, in the stochastic, when we say implicit, we are thinking about the, the algorithm for the equation. This is implicit. For the stochastic I, integral, it is explicit. To try and understand. Because adaptiveness, you know? But isn't that for, is that, isn't that term and cause stability problem? No. This, actually, this is nice. Actually, this, this goes smoothly. Of course, you have to work. You have to work with it. Uh, so this is completely what is, what is G, what is G is not G of two is nonlinear, and, and then I would expect trouble there. But, but apparently, there is, which I don't understand. But G, okay, G operator G, as I said before, it's nonlinear, but it is uh, um, uh, uh, linear growth. Mm -hmm. I'm a very, very naive question because because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There is no gradient here. You mean you mean no? Because it's yeah, it's G of U, the assumption that I took, even if I take gradient by the way, it doesn't uh, give me any trouble. But in this particular case, I assume that uh, G of U, G is uh, uh, sublinear. There is no gradient. You have a U, you can have, but you can have bounded operator. But the most you can have is a U. It's me, something here. But I still don't understand, even if you have a gradient, I don't understand the difficulty. I mean, I don't understand your objection in here. Well, I don't have an objection, I just have a question. Ah. Well, I, I, well, well, yeah. It's okay to just continue. Okay. So. As I said here, so the nonlinear term, this is where all the action is. And uh, T1, I, uh, I'll just show you the inequality for T1. The integral of Tj minus one Tj of T1, you can split it in the following. As I said before, you have Ej, I mean, you can take L4, L4, and then the gradient in L2. You know, so and you end up with the following estimate. You use some young inequalities, etc., and you end up with uh, delta one is just a small coefficient. You know, uh, h norm of gradient of dj that I, you can put on the left side, and the the term in red you have uh, two pieces. You know, you have the norm of dj in l two, which is nice, but then you have the gradient of u dj. Okay, and then you have to to deal with. 
This is the main point. T2 and T3 are really nice. They are similar in nature in the sense that you will have two terms that are nice. And the last one is also nice because it will use mainly, it will use somehow the boundedness of this term, of the moments of this term, and the fact that these terms are, um, this hold the regularity, and this is what will give you the rate of convergence, actually. The rate of convergence is controlled by the following term, you know? And I will show you in detail more uh, in there. So now you take the sum of all the terms, you know, you take the sum over all j's, and then you take the maximum over this k between one and n, and you get an estimate uh, of the following estimate. Uh, Mn, let me just say that Mn here is uh, the stochastic interval. Okay, so you have all these terms, and this is part wise for the moment. P almost surely. This is, let's recall that the sum of all these terms, when I put them all together. So these are all constants. I apologize that these are just constants. So Mn is related to stochastic interval. And uh, now, of course, we need to take the expected value and use a discrete Gonoma lemma in order to get an estimate on the expected value of the maximum of the f. Okay? Maybe I should. Maybe stay here. Is it okay if I stay here? Sure. They will hear me? Okay. Okay. So, so uh, in general, so now if we take the expected value of the estimate that I showed you before, let me just show you the estimate before here. If we take the, uh, the sum and then uh, you take the, so you take, uh, I took already the sum here, now I take the expected value. And in order for us to kill this stochastic integral, but then uh, here uh, you take also the expected value of the product, and then you can use Hodel inequality, etc. But here, when you take the expected value, you have the product. And in this particular case, the expected value of the product is different from the product of the expected value unless they are independent, which is not the case in general. Okay, so what to do with that? The only way, uh, and actually everybody does this, uh, the, since all the moments, the moments of this guy here are all bounded at any, any moment are bounded, uh, so we can localize. So instead of, instead of, in order for us to take the expected value, we localize first, and then we take the expected value. So we localize on some probability space where these guys are bound. Okay. So in fact, we define a, a probability space omega k n to be the set of all omegas in omega such that the maximum of this gradient is less or equal than this uh, bound n. And these are nice spaces. In particular, for example, the complementary of this uh, space uh, converges to zero when n goes to infinity. Okay? Because of the bound of the uh, of the moment of the gradient of U to J. Okay, so as I said, this is what uh, everybody does. For example, all the the convergence in probability as a consequence we get convergence in probability but localized so if you assume this condition j g and g prime uh, sorry here there is a mistake so if you assume g prime g and g prime and you take the initial condition it is the result the initial condition with an, a moment of order eight then for every k the error the localized error so you localize on this space uh, the localized error is less or equal than uh, it's of order h to the power eta, and this eta is one half. Uh, by the way, this is there is a square here. This is one half minus, which means that the error is of order one four minus. This is where Dobson, Guy um, Dobson, uh, did uh, a better job of uh, of getting one half minus. Okay. So this is, they got a localized, again, they got also a localized error, and it was uh, one half minus. Uh, 
Okay, so as a consequence, uh, in fact, with Ani, we did a little bit better, by the way. We did a little bit better for convergence in probability. We got one half minus, and uh, we had stronger conditions on the initial condition. Yes? Ah, pardon? Uh, no. Um, yes. Uh, what, what do you know about this omega? I mean, this omega K, um, the, the, the set. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. We could localize on the, uh, you know, we localize on this. So this is the set of all omega for which these are bound. And did you know that the, the, the expected value of the maximum you have yes. a priori bound on that? Yes, this is why we localize on that. Yeah, because so the probability of the complementary of this guy using the Markov inequality, this is which is the probability of this. So you use just the Markov inequality here, which is just for the over and the expected value of this, because the expected value of this guy is bounded, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then when m goes to infinity, this converges to. Yeah. Okay. So this is localized. This is a localized uh, convergence. So it's not strong, but uh, as a consequence, you can prove. I mean, uh, with an here, we prove as a corollary, just a corollary, you can prove the convergence in probability using, uh, you know, the probability of this set, the, the error uh, bigger than this estimate, you know, uh, you split it in two, you have probability of the complementary plus this uh, set, then you have to use this M because M depends on N, and you can, you know, you choose it appropriately in such a way that it will it will match all of them. these are all technicalities. But at the end, as a consequence of the localized uh, convergence, you have convergence in probability, which is weaker than the convergence in mean square. Okay. So, but but here you at least with Ani, this is the result that we somehow we got with Ani because we had better estimates that. Uh, Cavalier uh, Paul, we got it. You see that the least convergence is one half minus. Okay. Now, as I said, with Ani, we were able to prove the convergence in L2 of omega. And this is what was the first result where we have a convergence in L2 in E square. Our assumption is that uh, we took moments of order. So if you take the expected value zero, to the power two to the power q with q big or equal than three. So in particular for q equal to three, this is the same assumption as uh, Cavalier four. It's to the power eight, right? So uh, under that assumption, of course, this constant will depend on this q. I mean, everything is given. We were able to prove a convergence in mean square. This is the error on the grid point, but it is not nice. It's logarithmic. So, you know, it's not polynomial. And the order is logarithmic of order the following. Okay, this was in 2009. Now, this is for a multiplicative noise, like Cavalier uh, Court of, you know, linear, linear multiplicative noise. Now, if in the same paper, actually, so the idea of the proof actually was very naive. But at that point, nobody thought about it. The idea is that uh, the sketch of the proof is that the expected value of the maximum of the error, which is the convergence in L2, strong convergence, you just split it in two pieces. You split it, the, uh, you split the expected value of the localized one plus the one localized on the complement. Nothing there at This one is what everybody got right and we got also this was the convergence of order in our case one half minus right in uh, cavity call it was one fourth minus but then plus the following thing but the following piece the rate two and now in order for you to have rate of convergence you have to have the rate this rate and this rate have to be the similar and you have to, or or you can you have to take the one which is uh, which is lower of course Okay, but the second, uh, the second, this piece, uh, 
uh, we just use you know the expected value of uh, two random variables we use for the limit one nothing fancy as i said so uh, and we are going to use the fact that the omega m is um, it has a rate of commutes. it converges to zero when m goes to infinity so you use the, just the you know so the, the expected value of this guy you use holder you you have the expected value of this guy which gives you the probability and the expected value of this guy which we know we have moments that are bounded and the eight months since these are these are bounded we just have to have the rate of convergence for this set that we already have this was the idea okay now you know details uh of course this is why we get only the logarithm it comes from you know when we take the probability up you have this and then you know um i mean you get you get uh, logarithm because you have to equate this two and it's technical okay? oh you're taking the so you are now basically making the two terms the same order. Yeah, because I mean, oh, yeah, okay. they have to be, I mean, yeah. otherwise. Uh, what do you get? Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. this is where you get the exponent, the, the logarithm, because this this was an exponential, but then this means that you have to take the logarithm on both sides, and this yeah. is the one lower. It's, it's not nice, but actually we were able with this, but I don't want to show you because we have a better result in week here. Uh, when uh, here, in order for us to make it exponential to get rid of the logarithm, mm, we can do it with uh, with uh, the additive mode using an exponential moment. So we were able to do it, you know, here with just a bounded noise. But now I will show you there is a better way to do it directly, uh, directly with additive noise. Let, let me let me show you how we wrote another paper, which is nicer. And it's nice. The proof is, uh, how do you say, it is sharp. So if in the case of additive noise, like only for additive noise, we have really a strong rate of convergence and it is one half minus. So let me come back to the equation. In the case of W, let's say, for example, it's a Q in a process uh, of trace Q, just to make it work, you know. So, and then this is the equation. The, fully implicit as I, I wrote before. Now the noise is really additive and it's uh, colored in space, of course. Uh, it's a Q in a process, let's say. Like you rewrite now the, uh, by the way, uh, for this equation, what we were able to do something nice, by the way, is to prove some kind of exponential moment for the discrete uh, solution, which is not uh, simple to do. So if the initial condition is the gag in, uh, in uh, H1, in B, deterministic or stochastic with certain moment, exponential moments, uh, and you take this alpha to be small of order the viscosity divided by the trace of Q. This is a restriction. We are aware about that. Then we can find the positive constant Q1 of alpha such that for n large, the exponential moment of alpha, the maximum of the norm of H1 of UL, the discrete, which is the, the, the discrete implicit uh, uh, solution, UL, is bound. And this is nice. It's a nice thing. Not surprising for additive noise, but yes. So uh, let me write now the, uh, the error for when you have an additive noise. The difference between multiplicative and additive is that now the error today is going to be solution. And these are the nonlinear term, but this is zero now. I don't have the stochastic integral anymore. Okay. And um, as before, uh, in order for us to prove some kind of convergence of the error, we have just to do estimate for each term. And at the end, let me just show you, and you do the estimate for each term, etc. And we end up with the following almost sure estimate the maximum of Ej in S squared is less or equal than z plus t over ng. I'll show you what is z and g, the sum of ej and e squared. And this uh, g is, again, 1 plus c delta the supremum of this norm, us in f squared. square. And the g is, again, all, I mean, there are many pieces, but in particular, you have anything of order t over n, the moment the supreme of uk in f2 to the power four or to the power 
eight doesn't matter. They are all bounded, you know, uh, they have all moments that are bounded. And we have something similar, this kind of, you know, uh, uh, element. So we have an estimate of the following four. And now at this point, we can use Grand Val Lemma before taking the expected test. And this is a difference. When you have an additive noise, this is what we discovered. So we use a discrete Gromwell lemma to get the maximum of Pj in F squared, less or equal than, we will write this as Z, the portion, the elements that I showed you before, Z exponential Pg again. And now we use, we take the expected value. So first we do the discrete Gromwell lemma, then we take the expected value, not the right one. And of course, uh, when we do, when we take the expected value of this guy, again, you use, you know, um, hold the inequality here, the expected value here, the Q, the Z Q to the power of a Q, and the expected value of Pg. You will end up using, again, exponential moment, but uh, it's, it's doable, and it's direct, you see? So directly, we have the expected value of the M without going through the localization. Okay, so now, of course, the expected value of z to the power q to the power one over q, this, because of the whole irregularity, we will get something directly and it is part, it is t over n to the power eta, and eta is between zero and two. Okay, and uh, the same thing at the end, the result that we got for an additive noise is that uh, if you take the initial condition to be the deterministic or random with exponential moments, the trace of Q to be small, you know, like this is just mu square over uh, T, these are constants, C square. So these are the order, you have to pay for it. Then for any eta between zero and one, there exists a constant such as the error, which is a square, is less equal than C, T over N to the power A. So eta here is between zero and one, but you have a square, or you can get rid of the square, and here you will have eta over two. So it's one half minus the, uh, the rate and the history. Okay. And um, so, uh, as I said, we use this for other models. These are this is the so called Brinkman for Scheinman Navier Stokes equation. So, this is in 3D. This is uh, an equation. This is Navier Stokes. This is the same shape as Navier Stokes. These terms are called, uh, these are the Brinkman for Scheinman terms. And they include, for people that work in, the, in uh, porous media, these include terms like uh, permeability. So uh, these are important models actually in uh, porous media. So we have similar results in this particular case. We tried, by the way, we are interested in anisotropic models, uh, but it was really difficult for us. Instead of this viscosity to be on the whole operator, we take it to be uh, non-homogeneous, so to be zeros in, for example, in the third component, but it's very difficult. So uh, the other result that uh, we are, it's almost done, we are implementing this method for other models like the 2D Boussy method. So instead of having just the Navier Stokes, it is coupled with a concentration equation. And it's more complicated because the estimates are not easy, you know, to get. They are really coupled, but we are able to have, uh, I think we have also the rate of convergence of order one half minus. And uh, these are actually, it's not in, it's, I am saying it's uh, in progress, it's almost done, but other open questions that are, we are thinking about are the convergence pathwise. Uh, by the way, pathwise, it's not rough path theory. <laughs> they asked me last time, they asked me, is it pathwise? No, it's in probability, like pathwise, uh, probability pathwise. Uh, something that uh, I don't know actually how to do. Uh, when you have Dirichlet boundary conditions, I nobody did it. Uh, and we are thinking about it now because I mean, there are important problems. Now, these Dirichlet boundary conditions are really important. So in progress, we are thinking about it. And um, we are thinking about the Euler equation. Instead of uh, taking the viscosity to be strictly positive, we take the viscosity to be equal to zero. 
And uh, the last uh, maybe interesting open question, but it's difficult. I have to say that probably for Navi Stokes, we are no near anything. The weak convergence, meaning the convergence in distribution, because then you can improve the rate to be one half my uh, to be one is one minus instead of one half minus. So this is interesting, and I think I will stop. Thank you very much, Akima. Um, the floor is open for questions. I have a question. Um, so the uh, the implicit scheme. Um, well, you have to solve for the <laughs> for UL, right? Given UL by Good default. question. Yeah, okay. And that I mean, it didn't. Maybe I'm overlooking something, but it didn't. No, you did not easy, because we are right? working on something. You are yeah. right. Okay. Um, because you have to. This is even a nonlinear problem in front exactly. of them. Exactly. Exactly. So you you are really really correct and. Uh, let me just say, maybe there are experts here in numerical analysis. I was not when I started. And uh, I, uh, right now we are working with uh, somebody who implements this algorithm. I mean, when you do numerical analysis, you write it down and you want to prove convergence. But we, when you implement, you have to implement, you have to make it uh, run, right? Sure, yeah. And, and uh, in fact, in fact, let me just, I mean, the implicit, the implicit algorithm acts more stable than the, the explicit ones. But, but behind, behind the scenes, there is something behind that you have, there is a nonlinear problem that you have to solve. There is a fixed point argument inside. So we have right now, we are working on, I don't think this is your question, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so uh, let me go to the algorithm itself. Well, therefore, it's exactly. Yeah. So this, so this is really the main point, or even this one actually. But here, when you say when you implement, you assume you have the first one, u zero, right? You take uh, l equal to one. This is known. Then you have to compute to l. But here you have a, a you have a nonlinear search, right? So how do you do it? You are right. You have, in a certain sense, the people that implement it, they do like uh, an explicit, somehow they do it explicit. Right? They, they, you have to do a fixed point argument here. They linearize. They do, they do something behind it. This, we are trying to solve this. We are doing, uh, we are solving this problem. Like for the implicit, we are introducing an algorithm that solves this. If we do an iteration, so you have to do an iteration first for this to solve it, and then you do the discretization. You have to do multiple iterations. Multiple, to yes. To get the desired conversion. Exactly to correct. Convergence and to do the to do convergence you desire, and then, of course, mm -hmm. then your estimates uh, uh, only hold in, in case there is the perfect convergence. Yes, yes, because yeah, here you yeah, have two yeah, things. Yeah. You have to you have to write an algorithm for this to solve this nonlinear, you know, linearize, and then it has to be connected to the other one. And it's not easy because uh, I mean, uh, until now, <laughs> it's a nice one actually. <laughs> uh, you mean implementation? Uh, the whole thing, the whole thing, or uh, we have this equation. No, we are doing the OLED scheme, but uh, for then you, you have to do also the space. This is the direction of the video. This is the direction of the video, right? No, they use final video. We will use final For the space. No, for the space, we will use the He's a final payment guy. For the implementation, you will. But, but you have to prove the algorithm is running. Right? Mm -hmm. No, it's not obvious. 
given a fire elements to these yeah. guys. Okay. So when, when, you man, when you manage to take the point off, is that proof of the iteration converging? I am we are trying to prove the convergence, like proving the convergence is the point and there will be a limit to the iteration. Yes, yes. 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 That and iteration has to be connected to the time distribution. Yeah, that's fixed point might not be unique, of course. Uh, say it again. It might not be unique, the fixed point. Mm, not, yeah, not, it's not necessary. It's one way of doing it. Well, it's it's not it's not it will depend on the time step. Exactly right. But until I put my hands in, I have no idea, and and we are not even able to prove the convergence in L two so far because of this difficulty with convergence in probability of them. Yes. So yes, please go ahead. Uh, I mean, I mean, if I said correctly, if you, when you when you were stepping up the same theme, I mean, you said you need um, oh, uh, that, that you you need somehow to have measurability uh, the the time. Um, or here, only well, I mean, the I mean, no, but here. I mean, can't, can't we do something this somehow? I think it's somehow in this utilization of uh, Eto. Can you do Sartonovic? I mean, here, I mean, you know, I mean, 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 because it's another, it's a, a different, it's a different algorithm. Yeah. You could. Yeah. In our case, we, we do ITO. But in order for, for you to do ITO, you have to make sure that it's measurable. So we have to take the, I mean, it's too difficult. And, and by the way, uh, what is it? Maybe at the point of the No, but before I ask this. So here, when we do the explicit, then we don't know, I don't know how to prove it directly. I mean, the explicit scheme here, if instead of UL, UL, I do UL minus one UL, uh, we, we have actually we prove, we prove the convergence of the explicit, but by using the implicit, we cannot do it directly. It's the same difficulty as so the do, mixed point argument. Right. So you do assume, yeah, so if you do mm -hmm. it explicitly, then you do assume that the implicit one works. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But you cannot prove it directly. Like no. you know, you can do an ex ex explicit, and then you try to prove convergence. We don't know how to do it directly because it's the same difficulty as uh, we don't know. So I mean, I, I, I didn't understand all the words you said when you answered me. But did you do just on that that stochastic term and the time derivative term? Uh, what maximum principal analysis of the discretization? Then you see that in one time step it might be unstable because I think you call that sublinear, the, 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 the constant is very stochastic in time, but on the mean it will hit zero. So it never it never runs away. I mean that, that's how I convinced myself that that doing that term explicitly is is, is fine because the stochasticity takes care of oh you might be getting kicked off, but on the mean it levels out. I mean that that's uh, that's what uh, that's the empirical analysis that is. So I'm actually happy with the implicit. <laughs> doing an implicit goes wrong because then it would be left hand side to get the patient. The denominator might get zero for some or for close to zero. So then you need a time step description for the explicit. You need one for time step, but on the average, on the median, it averages out to zero. That's, that's mine. And I, I, I didn't understand. So I don't put a bit on the two thirds. So I am happy with you. With adding to you, we don't have this problem. But with the multiplicative, the multiplicative, uh, you, Maybe the multiplicative, we, have, we don't know. I mean, we didn't do the issues. Like, because. That's what I'm going to tell. But it's true, I don't know. I'm not expert in this mind now. We didn't even think of it because I mean, for in order for us, I'm talking about uh, the uh, multiplicative because here we don't need that. Yeah. It's just to take care of uh, the rigorous, you know, the stochastic integral has to be defined. I mean, although you can you can implement it if you want uh, numerically, but if you want to prove things in order for you to use stochastic analysis, you need uh, you need to be 
if I have this capacity to go on, this is where I'm taking you as my from. Yes. One implication is to say that, I mean, that the stochastic interval is implied as only after the after that, because it's a, it's a technical reason. It's a technical reason. have those expressions, but no, it's true to me that in multiply the inflows have a collapse relation. Yes. And in the limit, we have a non-trivial solution there. Exactly. So there is a, there is a quantity, there is a quality. Yes, you are. Yes. The implication yes. actually is that yes. both you, you basically the error consists of multiplication of two mm -hmm. increments, which do not uh, converge to the same small yeah. if you take delta to the zero. So yeah. They interfere both. And yeah. this yeah. is the point. And yes. this perhaps is error in the uh, in one of that kind of this or that way. Yes. You yes. could have this to come up. Yes. Uh, yeah. The order system, but then you have to take correction. Yes. So I don't know how we are doing time wise. There's a hard deadline that is 12.30, lunch, hot lunch will be served, and I think uh, there will be a bit of noise. So we have to have factor that in. What time is it? What's the time now? Done. I'm done. Done. Okay, okay, we're we're done. Done. Yeah, so um, we have a short break.